There we go. Um, so tonight, the topics we're discussing tonight are important. Um, and I would even say we're talking about the future of our community. We uh, have one special guest with us. Uh, you may be familiar that the, the borough has been without a borough manager for the better part of this year. So we were thrilled in recent meeting to be able to appoint uh, our new borough manager. So I'll have her introduce herself here in a moment. But the bulk of today's meeting is gonna be about concepts that have come out of a parks master plan with a committee and engineering uh, team that has been working on that. And we're also going to discuss a, an accompaniment to that and our streetscape project, this, uh, which is called a wayfinding system. So we have some concepts to share there. This is a loose breakdown of timing for this evening. Um, that doesn't mean we're wedded to it, just where I imagine we're gonna spend most of our time. Um, since we are dual format this evening, just a little, couple ground rules. If you are joining via Zoom, it looks like everyone's already doing it. Thank you for being muted. Um, just to make it easier for me, since I have an audience and a digital audience, um, if you could click the button that says raise your hand if you're on Zoom, that will tell me that you're looking to make a comment and I'll um, get to you as soon as possible. Uh, otherwise, please stay muted. And every slide in the deck is numbered. So if you wanna ask a question or comment and uh, reference a slide, please include the slide number so I can take us back to that. For our folks in person, again, thank you for being here. Um, same rules, just if you could just raise a hand so I know that you're hoping to make a comment. The um, sound is up here on the laptop. So I might ask if you're, unless you're willing to enunciate, um, if you'd be willing just to come sit up here so that the computer can catch your comments so we don't have to reiterate that for the folks at home. I want everyone to hear kind of the discussion. Um, and then otherwise, enjoy what we have. It, we look forward to agreement or disagreement just as long as everything's respectful. So we appreciate that in advance. All right, so with that, um, I'd like to introduce our, everyone here is a special guest, but our uh, <laughs> very special guest for the borough um, is Katie Stringent who uh, is wave, waving her hand here, so I will clap to Katie. So I will just move over this way so that hopefully the folks virtually can hear me as well. Please. Um, so good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us um, and for being here both in person and virtually. That's me, I'm the very special guest. Um, I was appointed as borough manager um, very recently and I started on Monday. If there is anything I can help you with, if there is any assistance that I can provide to you, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. This is a very exciting time for the community and I'm very glad to be part of all of this. Um, so you all know where to find me. Um, I've been working in and around local government since 2008. Um, I'm a cat lady, so my cat is in my bio. Um, so uh, if there's anything I can do for you, again, please let me know. Thank you for having me this evening. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it's her second, third day now today, and she, she's still here. So we're pretty thrilled about that. Okay. Um, so as I said, our first item for this evening is to discuss our parks master plan. This is across all six parks in the borough. Um, you'll see each of them. What we, uh, the committee, I would say, has set out to do is how can we invest in the beauty, recreation, and outdoor amenities that our community deserves. That's a really important word. Um, we know what we're accustomed to, um, but I think that even just a light comparison to other communities, you know, maybe where you take your kids or go with your grandkids or just go for a walk with your spouse, uh, you know that there are some parks elsewhere and other amenities that we just don't have. And it's about time that we reinvest and make sure that we're, we're worth it too. So um, with that, um, just a brief comment on the roadmap. We secured grant funding for the Parks Master Plan probably a year, a year ago. Um, the committee was formed. There's a number of committee members here this evening, so thank you. Um, there's some council participants on it. There's some constituents. There's good age diversity, um, folks that have school age children, folks that may have grandkids, um, engineering talent, landscape architects. Um, we ran the gamut. So I thank you all for those who participate on the committee. Uh, the report was drafted. Um, I'm holding it here. It's, it's a beast. 
Um, and otherwise we we publish it, but it's still in draft form. We will publish it when it's done. So we had the, the report drafted, the committee gave feedback. What you're seeing tonight is that bottom middle tab, which is the second round of revisions. And we don't wanna wait anymore. We want people to start to give us direct feedback from the public. Um, after that happens, we will go into third rounds of revisions and hopefully publish that report um, digitally. I'm not gonna print this for you all, sorry. Um, and then uh, the next step would be that council, base, council basically starts to consider which projects are priority, maybe all of them, and then deal with the financial ramifications of what it would take to get it done. So thankfully we're close. Um, quick question, yep. Yeah, I got a couple of people that text me and said they, they need a passcode to get in. They, they get should in. not. because we. what I thought I said, I told them, but they know there was something that they were missing. Yeah, I was gonna say, I've got folks online that didn't need it. Okay. So sure. have them, check. yeah, make sure they click the link on the website directly. Hopefully that'll help. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through all six of our parks. Um, I'd ask that we reserve questions for the end only because you may be interested in an amenity that may be at another park. So maybe it's not a Hamilton, but it may be somewhere else. So if you could, and again, try to just be mindful of um, what slide we're looking at, bank that question. I promise you'll have all the time in the world. Um, but first we're gonna run through all of the concepts uh, for all the parks and then we'll take a break and talk about it. The first one is Hamilton and Hamilton is broken into three different areas, upper, lower and then the rear which is where the Quonset hut and the basketball court is in the back so we have suggestions for uh, sketches for all three so what you're looking at is upper hamilton um, there has been a lot of interest in having a water amenity for families and uh, it's a keen observation the leftmost item uh, the green with kind of the design on it, that is going to be a splash pad. Um, if you are someone who is interested in a pool for the borough, um, I just don't think that that's a practical dream for us, but that doesn't mean we can't make it happen with a different type of amenity. That's about 20, I think 22 to 2,500 square feet in that leftmost location. Adjacent to that would be a brand new playground with that rubberized matting underneath it. Adjacent to that, uh, the rectangle, the blue rectangle would be, actually I can draw on here. The blue rectangle here is a swing set. What you see here is just some benches and other furniture, perhaps public art that would be sprinkled throughout. This is the existing uh, park uh, rentable facility. So that stays the same. This is the restrooms across the way, that stays the same. What's really important in upper, uh, we do some trail extension and we're doing so per, uh, purposefully, what you see here trailing off to the left is we have flagged a major accessibility issue for pedestrians uh, given our topography. We're a very high to low community. Uh, we would like to be building a pedestrian pathway that would take someone from the top of Hamilton down to what is Fountain Street. Fountain Street runs behind Mindful Brewing. Um, if we can get people from up to down to Fountain Street, it's only a basically two block walk from there to get to the corner of Castle Shannon Boulevard and Route 88. And from there, you're into town. Uh, if you were down in town right now, if you were at Martin's Auto and someone said walk to Hamilton Park, you'd say call an Uber. And we can't have that because um, a lot of our community would like to be able to walk and enjoy that, that trip up. So that extension of the trail is mindful of connecting to a future ramp and or staircase. We're unsure what we would do just yet. You also see a trail extension towards the rear. If you've been up to Hamilton, this is along the fence line up there. What we'd like to do is create little vistas up there. Um, in the foreground, if you looked over the hill, there's a lot of trees there. You would see Route 88 and the traffic. But above that, you actually see a beautiful vista out over Mount Lebanon Golf Course. You can see Myrtle School, you can see some of our churches, um, and even down 88, depending on the Vista, um, back into the T station, the fire department, et cetera. Um, we're blessed with the views that we have, but we don't take advantage of them. So Hamilton being one of those topmost areas, we'd like to better make use of the Vistas and create those little moments for folks to enjoy. 
going down into what would be kind of, it's still upper Hamilton, but we'll call it the middle. Um, this is an underutilized area. Right now there's kind of a horseshoe pit, a shelter that isn't in great shape and a half basketball court. Um, we're completely revisioning that area. I would consider it kind of the left to nature portion. If anyone has been to the Pittsburgh Botanical Gardens um, out near the airport, um, that's what's inspiring this space. You can see some, some concepts out here, but it's treed, it's uh, mostly just artful landscaping, it's plant diversity, and we're trying to make it such that you can kind of get sucked into nature and just enjoy a quiet walk. This is for our dog walkers, our parents for whom the kids are up at the playground and they just need a moment to themselves. Uh, we need to embrace just the, the kind of plain green beauty as well as the athletic or the programmatic side of recreation. Um, so that's what that's mindful of down here. There is a little bit of a lookout that would look over Lower Hamilton, but um, primarily it's kind of a ambulatory walk get uh, gets some nice quiet for yourself. So that's Upper Hamilton. We're gonna to move to Lower Hamilton. Lower Hamilton is seeing a lot of change. I'll start with what isn't apparent in this. Um, there is a proposal that we change the ball field and the soccer fields to a turf surface. Um, this is a significant change down there, but it's one that unlocks some other opportunities for us. The first is that uh, the grass is, as you can imagine, yes, it has maintenance issues, but it actually has a lot of drainage issues as it is. If you've ever seen the, the near the baseball field that gets washed out on a regular basis um, and rains are not making it any easier with how often they're happening. It also allows us to put lines down that still accommodate baseball, would accommodate a full court, so from left to right, or a full field soccer field for older children. Um, so that would be soccer or field hockey or equivalent. And then for the younger children, U8s or what have you, you have up to three, three fields uh, sideways that could fit within that same footprint. Not as easy to do that when you can't paint the lines and um, there's leveling issues out there. Uh, if it rains, it's wet, it's squishy, turf uh, is engineered to absorb the elements and would allow us to more functionally uh, accommodate any rainwater that, that hits the surface. Um, of course, it's a major expense. It's probably the biggest cost factor if we chose to do it, but it also would be a pretty transformative and perhaps in a great way. So that's the field. Um, the same uh, walking trail around exists uh, in this as it currently exists out there now. Um, there was some interest, and rightfully so, in replacing a play set that was uh, taken away due to safety concerns prior. Um, we do have two play sets, you see me highlighting them now, that are going to be placed uh, closer to where the current tennis courts are. We're also changing the configuration of the tennis courts so that there are two um, pickleball courts, as that has gained in popularity and is a little bit more accessible for uh, older residents or less uh, mobile residents. Behind that tennis court is what could be an extended walking trail with what is more of a rain garden. Turns out we have a lot of moisture back there. If you've ever seen that retaining wall, uh, it's tilting and it does capture a lot of water. So something needs to happen back there to better stabilize that area. Um, so we would like to do a demonstration project such as a rain garden and we may even be able to make it uh, available for residents to see. And then uh, the other big change is that we're changing the configuration of the buildings down in Lower Hamilton. Currently, there is a building off to the left, or you're seeing it up north here. Um, and there's a separate building that has covered seating. We want to combine those and consolidate the footprint such that there's better egress to get to the rear portion of Hamilton Park. So what's imagined here, and you can't read it too well, but this topmost portion is a pavilion. Uh, styled similar to this. This isn't an actual architectural rendering, but plenty of covered seating. It has restrooms and a commercial kitchen inside, still rentable for all the events that people celebrate down there. What it has off to the other side, however, is a built stage. We currently have to bring in a stage on a trailer for community day. This would allow for movies in the park. This would allow for musical uh, events and anything that people would need to gather for 
uh, it will have a stage ready set with electrical and, and other amenities nearby. We are taking down at least one and maybe both of the public works facilities that are back there. Uh, so some of this building footprint will be dedicated to storage for the borough for assets that would be needed to be on that side of town. Okay, that's Lower Hamilton. So back where you said you were going to take down, uh -huh. what's the blue stuff? Is that to the top, in the top right corner? Is that yeah. the basketball court that'll just be freshened up? So, yep, I'm going to show you that right now. Oh, sorry. Well, that's okay. <laughs> you said that's Lower Hamilton. I thought you were moving on to like... Nope, <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. So what you see here, um, right now in the rearmost portion is the Quonset Hut. So that's rendered here. Um, we are imagining a full court basketball court here. What you're seeing, though, is a dual purpose court that actually mm -hmm. would allow for food trucks to park on it. Um, for residents that host parties, they often are asking, can I bring my own food trucks? Um, so we want a ready kind of purposed, dual purpose court there so that cars can park there. For community day, we actually may be able to move all of our food vendors into one place in the rear, which would be, I think, a really nice improvement instead of driving all over our fields. Uh, we've had many years where that became an issue. If we are, council may choose to move this Quonset hut to a different location. And if so, this court may move back such that we would not need to drive over the court, rather the food truck uh, park, if you will, would remain in front of it and the court would simply be moving backwards. Um, I said basketball court, but this is a multi-purpose sport court. You can play tennis, you can play volleyball, you can play all sorts of things there. Um, so it's, it's multi-configurable. And then along this little narrow portion, we also will have built-in pits for cornhole and for horseshoes. Um, horseshoes were in the middle portion of the park. We are still keeping them, just moving them to the lower part. All right, so that's Hamilton. And I know people are eager to ask questions, but like I said, you may just wanna see, wait until we see what the other parks have because some of those amenities may be elsewhere and you'll, that'll better inform your perspective on this. All right. Next, we're going to the Municipal Center. So right now, that's where we're up on McRoberts Road. Um, we host a lot of tournaments there. That is a grass baseball field, but there's also a lot of underutilized space up there. So what is imagined here? I'll start in the upper portions. Currently, this is just an empty green space. Um, and in this portion here, we actually have a gymnasium. We are proposing to tear down the gymnasium. It does not have uh, HVAC. It has perpetual water damage. There is mold and rot because it is not uh, well engineered. And we're eager to repurpose that space for more productive use. Now parking is yes, a productive use, but it actually allows us to uh, put more uh, amenities nearby such that we can absorb more people onto that site. If you've been there during a baseball or softball tournament, uh, parking is at a premium. So finding ways to enhance parking is, is useful. What you see here is again, another full court multi-purpose basketball court. So if we did the Hamilton one in here, you'd have two um, modular multi-sport courts. I think that's great for the community. Um, we're proposing a sand volleyball court, which may lean more towards the adult uh, variety of, of recreation. Um, both would be lit at night, as would much of Hamilton Park. Sorry, I didn't mention that before, but we are proposing that we're lighting those fields, the lower portions, such that people can recreate longer into the evenings, not just until dusk. Um, I don't have hours for you, but longer into the evenings. There is currently this walking trail that goes around that will remain. Down here, there is an extension of the parking I would say something like 12 or 14 spaces are added because the playground that is here is consolidated into a new and shaded playground. This is an amenity that many parents have been asking for, uh, sun sails covering a playground. Um, so we're proposing that at Municipal, so we would replace the existing. We would reconfigure the rear portion here. The batting cage would be gone as it's underutilized or not utilized. We would be adding what you see over here as covered swings and they are facing the field so brother or sister can watch their siblings uh, play sports. 
We still have seating here for parents. Uh, we're adding covered seating. So the existing uh, pagoda, if you will, will go away and we'll rebuild a new one. And then in this middle portion, uh, the snack stand mm -hmm. that is inside the municipal building, we would like to build an extended deck off of it. So parents and children can actually, if you've ever been to the Buckos games, you can kind of stand at uh, with a rail in front of you and sit with your drink or whatever and then watch the game. That's what's mindful there, that little deck extension, a nice vista back into the field. And we're also willing to build into this hillside uh, seating. Right now, parents often are, uh, are in the parking lot of the police department or in the upper parking lot where these cars are parked. Um, additional seating would go a long way to, to give people a better place to, to enjoy the game. Okay, um, so that's Hamilton. The field is staying the same. It's already lit. Uh, all of the other amenities, or I said that's Hamilton. That's municipal. Um, and um, we will make sure that the walking trail remains continuous. Uh, we get a lot of walkers up there. Um, so we, we certainly want to accommodate that. All right, so that is municipal. We're gonna move on to real. So real, if you're not familiar, right off of Killarney. Uh, so on the sixth street side of town, we're proposing a brand new amenity, um, which is deck hockey. Um, it's the type of amenity that needs to be positioned strategically because it can be a loud sport and it can be a sport that uh, goes into the evenings if you are attracting leagues, but real is probably the best place for it as it is adjacent to Carpenter's Connection and a lot of industrial uses, commercial uses. And it is also nestled um, in a, a, a tree lined area, but also with housing above and below, but not in immediate proximity. Um, so we do believe that that can be a comfortably placed use. We also get a lot of water issues on that side. There was consideration of putting the spray park at Real Park, but um, if we did that, our summer camps could not use it because that's not where they locate. And a lot of engineering would go into that hillside that I just don't think would go well with um, some of the water retention issues we have. Uh, what you see, these uh, blue triangles are shaded seating. Um, I think we went a little copy paste happy with these, but you know, some, <laughs> maybe half as many of those, that would be fine, but a nice improvement there. Uh, we're adding two new, uh, as many as three, we'll see, but at least two new um, playgrounds. There's a really dilapidated one at the rear part of Real Park, and uh, that needs to go, but we will replace that. Um, this uh, shelter here, uh, and again, this is a rented field. We will keep that. We will make sure that that continues to be the case. People can use it for that purpose. We will have a full uh, walking trail around it. And this yellow line is a replaced retaining wall in the back. Um, it, it's doing its job still, but it is showing signs of decay. Um, we would like to be able to use that for both uh, a green wall slash art uh, placement, um, just to pretty it up and give people something interesting to look at as they take it in. The existing soccer field here will remain the same. There is space and we would keep uh, a soccer field also to the left side and uh, for younger kids, of course, with the uh, dimensions. But otherwise, real is staying the same, no enhancements to parking, um, but with a brand new amenity in town. We did do some market research as far as the desirability of deck hockey. There are a number of leagues and that is not a common amenity. So you very well may get leagues, uh, adult or, or juvenile leagues, that um, are interested in renting that. It would also give CSYA a reason to recruit for a new sport. And uh, that would be a wonderful thing for girls and boys. All right, so that's Real Park. A couple more. Chestnut Parklet. Um, I didn't have a digital scan of this, so you're just gonna see a Google Maps version. So Chestnut Parklet is at um, Myrtle and Chestnut, so right uh, not far from where we are. So that way from the library. Um, this park was recently in, reinvested in. We made a single basketball court into a full court. Uh, we added some fencing. We added some landscaping in the Southern portion uh, and just did some prettying up. So uh, largely we're keeping this the same. The only proposed changes is we're going to upsize the shaded shelter there. 
there's only room for one table and there's more than there's more families there than that can hold. So we would expand upon that just to give a little bit more shade. Um, things like planting trees and just putting up the landscaping throughout. I'm not a big fan of traffic barriers where we don't have to use them. So maybe using more hardscape like large oversized rocks that still do the purpose of making that a safe area, but it doesn't look like it's, you know, the, the North Shore during a Steeler game. Um, I just think that that makes for nicer parks. So again, that, that is a smaller scale investment, but still an important one for that, that park. It wouldn't surprise me if some of us weren't familiar, why is this not, there we go, with Prospect Park. Prospect Park is nestled in the neighborhood that is above uh, Mindful Brewing. So if you go up the side of Mindful Brewing and turn right on Prospect Street, um, Prospect Park is nestled up there. Um, it does not have a much there. And recently there's a, a downed tree that damaged some of the amenities. Um, what we thought here is again, another what they call passive park. Um, there would be a lot of plantings, uh, something more like a pavilion and maybe an overlook at that northern end uh, where you can look back into town. As we said, we're leveraging viewpoints at Hamilton and maybe viewpoints here as well. Um, what's interesting is this is currently configured as a triangle. So this roundabout does not exist right now. It's a, it's a complete triangle around. But uh, that also means there's no parking there. So creating the roundabout would give us at least uh, lined parking in the roundabout that we could have folks that actually drive up there and, and make use of it. But um, it, it's, it's a hard to configure space. It's topographically challenged. There's a high point, a low point. Uh, you have utilities to contend with and paved surfaces. So um, I will say this one's a bit vexing. It's a little hard to get this one right. It's also an expensive one relative to the footprint, but um, we don't want to, to forget that that side, uh, you know, it's just far enough there, just far enough to be a decent walk from Hamilton Park. So uh, we'd like to still do some improvements in that area as well. And then our final formal park is O'Brien Field. Um, so uh, this is on uh, Maplewood um, up past, um, if you go past the um, car deal or car repair shop on Sleepy Hollow up the hill to the right. This is a baseball field. We maintain it, but we don't play anything here because uh, parking became problematic for the residential street that's up there. Common for dog walkers, people just enjoying, you know, a quiet spot in nature. Um, we tried every which way to do something interesting here, but we realized that um, a park style use is not the highest and best use there. So I will tell you that the recommendation probably from the committee is going to be that nothing substantial changes there. However, um, there may be a future need for us to relocate our public works department. Um, so this is a rendering of if we built from the ground up a new public works facility, a uh, salt shed, a Quonset hut and um, you know, a, a sizable new facility. This is not an immediate need. Um, I think we're talking like a decade before something like this becomes realized. We certainly aren't gonna let the park deteriorate. It may just stay as it is, but um, it does not have compelling residential redevelopment use. Uh, we've talked to developers and that, that isn't a great site for it. And um, you know, there are considerations there that uh, not having utilities, being kind of nestled in the hillside. There are some limitations making it like an attracting type amenity for the community. So again, when you go to your neighbors or you look on Facebook and someone says they're taking away our baseball field, we are not. It's maybe a decade away. And that's if we don't choose to renovate in place where our public works facility is now. But um, it's good for us to at least have a concept that we can work with. Now we have six parks, but I wanted to add one more. The place where we are now, it's not a park, but it is absolutely one of the most important recreational, educational, and cultural institutions here. Now the library has made uh, improvements over time internally, but there's work that needs to be done externally to really set it off as a unique asset. Um, this is a slightly different style um, that we're showing as a rendering. One of our residents is a landscape architect and she generously donated her time to do some renderings for us. So what you see here, this, uh, the, the north side here is Myrtle Avenue. So the front side of the library this way. Um, 
What we'd like to do on the front of the building is create some movable seating so folks can enjoy the outside and create some shade, shade with some shade sails. Say that 10 times. Um, we would update the signage. So there would be an electronic sign showing all the programming that's going on uh, at the library. This right side lawn, uh, again, passive use, maybe what are reading hammocks or other forms of shaded tree lined uh, places. Um, it's a great lawn out front, uh, but shade is probably something that we could benefit from out there. Along this right side, this is a street, um, well, or a, a little alleyway. And um, there's some really neat instances where people have actually created murals on uh, pavement to create an interesting walking surface for folks to enjoy. Um, so instead of that being just kind of where the UPS drivers do a UE in the middle of their routes, uh, let's make it something that's unique. We may even block it off to vehicular traffic and let it just be a pedestrian area. Um, of course, our educators here, our librarians could find really interesting ways to use that too. So this isn't an exact rendering, but just an example of what other cities have done. Uh, this is an example of uh, shade sales down here. And um, this is an example of some movable furniture, these movable chaises that would be maybe a good fit out there. This side of the parking lot would largely remain the same, perhaps the inclusion of a, a new garden or a fairy garden right outside here. The lower portion is where you'd probably see the most change. What we're suggesting first is that we relocate the dumpster here, which is right in the middle of, of the, the property and uh, creates this ugly eyesore out there. So we're gonna relocate that elsewhere. The lower lot, however, we'd like to make it an outdoor education center. So this is a building that is built more like a stage. Um, you can see some, some a rendering here in the middle, not an exact rendering, just a for instance, um, but something where our educators on good weather days, or even if it's slightly raining, but otherwise temperate, they could go out there and do something interesting with programming. If, uh, I mean, we've got the Halloween parade that's coming, why not host it outdoors? You have the speaker up front with a microphone and, and awarding the children in front of everyone else. We're considering a, a dual surface here. So there might be a paved area, but there also might be what are called grass pavers, which are, you can drive on them, but they truly look like grass. You have to cut it. Um, but just a way to change the texture up and you can actually have the children sit on grass, even though they're in a parking lot, which is kind of interesting. And then maybe most importantly, this, uh, what is just a grassy transition point in the parking lot, we'd wanna make that seating um, so that you actually can have an audience there where kids can sit on the rails, so to speak, or on the stones and enjoy a program, whether that's music or dancing or something cultural, uh, you could do films here as well. I mean, what a nice addition to an already wonderful library, but just makes so much better use of their physical assets. So, that's the library. One more slide and then we're gonna break because you wanna talk. How are we gonna pay for all of this? <laughs> um, so the good news is that we are in a, a very good financial situation. Um, I thank my colleagues who are on council that are with me and my our predecessors that had good fiscal sense. We have an excellent bond rating um, and the bond environment right now is such that it's very low cost to issue new bonds. And it's actually possible, at least where the finances look now, that some portion of these parks could improve, be improved without the requirement of a tax increase. And the reason why is because we already dedicate enough millage to our debt service that we can refinance the existing bonds and keep the same debt service. So no more debt annually, which means we don't need a, another assessment on, on families to get that done. Um, Again, it depends on how big or how small the scope moves. So I can't say hard and fast, but we've done enough diligence with our bond council to know that this is at least on the table as a tax neutral set of improvements for the borough, which is fantastic. Um, standing on the shoulders of giants there. All right, you've been so gracious, thank you. So let's talk about parks. Um, and again, either speak loudly or if you wouldn't mind, join me up here, that's up to you. I can speak loudly. Okay, hi. I actually have two questions. Okay. One is dealing with the fields. Mm -hmm. Are they strictly rentable or can you can kids have a pickup game on them? Definitely have pickup games. The mm -hmm. borough and our staff would be responsible for managing any rentals, just like the shelters. There is a chance that leagues would get some time, but it's our community. Our kids should be able to go and start a game 
you know, or at least there should be knowledge of when there's open field versus not. Okay, that was my next question as to whether or not there will be posting. And my other question has to deal with Lower Hamilton. Sure. I like the idea of the playgrounds. I'm just going to pull it up. Because that pavilion is rented so often, and it's, you know, graduation parties, it's birthday parties, yes. a lot of it's for young children for their birthday parties. Is there no feasible <coughs> way to get a playground closer to the pavilion so that the parents could be there with their kids? And still enjoy the party. Um, I, I, I would say, based on what I'm seeing, uh, it's a comparable footprint here as it would be here. You're dealing with maybe some buffer zone here as far as where the property line is, plus or minus. Um, but even without uh, having an engineer's expertise, I would say it is viable. Yes. I just, I, I just, to me, that feels like that would be a better use of that space because, like I said, I know we've had family reunions. I've got young grandchildren. There's my relatives have young children. And if you're going to have to be with your kids down at the other end, you kind of miss the whole party. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank okay. you. Other questions, concept, or comments, please. I think I kind of agree with that. Just like I'm going off in the summer, right? Yes. So that would be nice, even if you took one of those and you were able to position down there. Yes. Because you do have strategic points where people are. To have that extra, whatever you want to call it, I mean, place that, whatever it is, um, right there would be good for you know, those kids that maybe don't want to be playing soccer or whatever the activity, they're right there. Some kids are crafting. You have that feasibility of having that right close to the to the pavilion. So that, that I think that actually, if you could do it, is, is a very nice uh, thought, nice idea. Okay, thank you. So with yep. the thought of these, these three fields, like being able to do three smaller fields. How many physical parking spaces are there? Is there any thought if we end up moving that back um, storage shed or whatever, and we move all of that back? Is there a plan to possibly extend and put some more parking in there? Because I know it can get, even when there's just baseball that's down there, to get some more parking spaces in there for, for people to park down there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so our, I guess I'm not agreeing. I'm, I'm agreeing that yeah. it's an important point. So the current rendering does not expand parking, largely because uh, this area here, this is the dumpster and this is the trail up. That's very steep. You maybe have walked it. Yeah. Um, there's actually even some uh, gabion baskets there, I think, that are holding up the hillside. So there would be dirt work there and almost assuredly retaining walls in order to expand that. So. Uh, I can't say definitively that that lot would see an expansion or that it would be cost effective to do that. I think there is a reality that it may be that if folks are patronizing lower Hamilton, it may become more common that they have to park in upper Hamilton and walk. Yeah. Um, but a very fair question is, well, hold on, you're making upper Hamilton a marquee place with a splash pad. So um, we, we unfortunately are not, we're not busting at the seams with parking. Um, we may just be dealing with more of a busier configuration in our marquee park, but um, I don't think it's a bad thing for the engineers to at least say what, where, if anywhere, can you squeeze out any spaces um, with the existing footprint? Yes. Um, just thinking, I, we don't have any place for spectators besides the parking lot to watch the games. And is there, I know we can't squeeze much but that's a thought that needs to be. Yeah, it's a good point. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's not represented here. So anywhere that's in this middle portion, we can't install seating just because if it's baseball, they need the field. Right. However, just beyond the trail, it is possible in that flat or grassy area that we could have something that's seating. Um, you do still have, it's, again, it's not shown on here. There is seating for baseball right. flanking here, mm -hmm. but as it relates to soccer, uh, there isn't any installed that's in the rendering, but it's a good consideration. Another question. Okay. Um, so this multi-court that you're putting in this back area, I know a lot of the other um, municipalities around us have done these courts. Are we looking into making that uh, a four-season court that we could put some sort of dome or something over top so it actually could be used in the wintertime? Uh, I'm not ruling it out. Um, I do believe that the, the footprint, that, that well, that is a narrow strip 
So it's possible that the, the proposed one in municipal would be or better for yeah, a dome, a but it is an interesting question of, can we build ones uh, with the assumption that we'd like to do it four seasons? Mm -hmm. um, so again, that one might be space constrained, but I think it's a good idea. Yeah, please. So the I'm trying to talk loud so they can hear. Me. Thank you. Um, the I forget what you use the term, but the shading things. Yes. Uh, I'm in all of the parts. I'm, I'm just curious. Do you have any idea what? Maybe not that one, but the the ones that are more smaller. Okay. Do you have any idea what the life of them may be? Because I'm wondering, are they? Two year life, and we're replacing them every two years, and you know, cost wise. Um, also, are they are a lot of them going to be seasonal? Uh, you know, you're going to take them down maybe in October and put them up in April, or are they going to be more permanent kind of stuff? Okay. I'm just thinking long term cost. So, if they come down or if they wear really quick, and now we're replacing them, not that shading's not a good idea. Sure. I think the sun. So okay. <laughs> I'm all about shade, but I'm just thinking cost sure. effectiveness. Um, so we have our borough engineer. Do you have experience with this shade sales as far as durability? Yeah, in, in, in a lot of cases, uh, for instance, in poor insulation, things like that, where municipalities have shade structures, they can take them down over the winter to get them out of the elements. I guess I don't know if they're made. Uh, a lot of times it's, it's canvas. That's why I'm saying that's why I'm thinking yeah. where. It, it does wear a lot in UV. Um, I know similar ones that, that we have specified, uh, particularly over the fall control. That, those have been in about five years, and they're not they're not showing a lot of wear. Yeah, yeah Scott Township has has some as well. That, that been there a little less, three years. But the, you know, the key is having the manpower to, to take those in seasonally. That they keep them out, you know, the elements. Well, when, when you don't need them, obviously, you're going to keep it some. But it is a very good question. Yeah. But it, it's, it's an investment that's a wearable item. And it's, um, it's, it's, it's one that is fairly recent, if you will. And I tend to think that. You're going to see smaller businesses pop up with commercial sewing machines that, that are able to take um, canvas and, and replace them fairly easily, fairly locally. Um, I think that's a you're going to see a lot of that, that type of thing. And again, just for our friends on Zoom, if you didn't hear that, uh, the question was about the durability of the, the shade sails. They're likely made of canvas, but our borough engineer believes that five-ish or five plus years is not unreasonable with proper maintenance. Um, one just additional note on maintenance, uh, we are designing for those uh, springier park surfaces. If you're familiar, most of our park surfaces are mulch beds. So significant savings, effort and cost to not have to mulch as many beds. But also if we did turf the field, we currently cut that field and we cut it regularly. So to have that off of the cut list would also be a meaningful time and uh, resource savings. Ma'am, I think you had, yeah, please. I am thoroughly perplexed by Westbeck Park. Sure. Fusion. I'll pull back up. To me, it looked like that was a lot of just green space. Yes. But there are many, many family, young children up there. Mm -hmm. Where are you going to put them? Yeah, so um, what is that? <laughs> uh, well, which one? This one here? Yeah. So this would be uh, functionally a traffic circle where people could park on it. So we would round out, so uh, punctuate the street so it doesn't go continuous side to side. You may be able to pick up some parking on this side if we keep some of the street here. Obviously, we have to have egress for this property owner. And well, this, oh, well, there you go. So you have to have a driveway <laughs> uh, or access. So there may be parking here, but the idea, and again, as you know, since you live up there, um, it, it's not well trafficked. Certainly there are families up there, but this isn't the place where 15 cars are gonna pull up on a day. So we think that accommodating just some street lined um, spaces for five cars, six cars, um, that means- It's may a walkable park though. I mean, every, nobody drives there to go to the park. They all walk there. I think, yes, if you're up on there, I agree with that. Um, I think it's more 
if we're reinvesting it in a big way, we want to make it so that the person that lives on Killarney, they're going to drive there. And if they want to go and use it, we do need to be able to accommodate some reasonable flow of people there. Um, but it has, to your point, it has been this kind of nestled park. And um, unfortunately, it's been largely ignored for that reason. So it's this notion of we want to restore it, we want to make it sing. But if we do that, then we have to say, well, then people are going to go. And then we have to accommodate the people that are going. But your initial point about children's furniture and play equipment, I think that is the theme of this park at committee level was how do we unlock it as just kind of this nestled park, not to drive a lot of traffic to it. I think your point is well taken though, that there are families up there that if they did just get to walk around the block and use it as more of a recreational thing for kids, um, we may want to include furniture that they can use it in that way. So it's a point well taken. The park's been there over 65 years. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Might be the last time we put money into it too, Mayor. I hate to say it. Yeah. Um, let's go here. Just yeah. Go ahead. All right. Um, with the volleyball court, are we looking at putting a cover, having a cover for it? Uh, only for knowledge of knowing with volleyball, that can become a very big uh, kitty litter space. Uh, <laughs> ample space. So I'm, I'm just thinking on longevity of it. And I know that they can be tough to maintain too. You, you end up having grass grow. And so I didn't know if there was going to be some kind of cover. I mean, it doesn't have to be anything amazing, but something to cover it up when it's not in use. I don't know about day to day, not in use, but certainly out of season. I think we would certainly consider that. Yeah. The, the wear and tear on these courts, they have a gravel base. And then it's a very, if you buy like the highest quality sand, it's a very low grain, like small grain. Um, and to keep it nice. Yeah. You want to make sure you're not getting debris. If anyone's been up there, there's a thousand turkeys at any given day. You don't want them do nesting in there or anything. So um, the good news is that we're right there. So you'll have eyes on it versus if it were more distant. Uh, we also are considering you may need netting on the periphery, on the trail side mm -hmm. for balls that get flung up. So there may be a consideration for netting just to keep the ball in place. Okay, so my second one was just about the sport courts because they are multi-purpose. You have your ability for uh, volleyball, basketball, any of those. How will like the ability for the nets and such, who's gonna be taking care of those? Because I mean, we're just gonna be honest, there's a lot of people that don't take care of things. Um, mm -hmm. So I know we have cameras in most areas, but who's gonna be involved in, in dealing with changing nets and things along those lines? Good question. Um, so if you didn't hear, the question is for anything that's a consumable or you have to install for a use on a sport court, like you get the tennis net out and you put it back, who's gonna manage that? Um, so my vision for our community is that we do more in recreation than we're currently staffed to handle. We have a great staff, but uh, as far as rentable spaces, it's the pavilions for parties. It's the rec rooms within the municipal building, which don't get a lot of rentals. Um, but that's basically it. And it's largely a function of capacity. Obviously we don't have the assets built yet. So I think it is a reasonable question saying, are we, do we want to be the type of borough that is staffed to be able to do nice things like, hey, every day what rentals went out, what rentals go in, you have to take inventory, you have to assess if there's damage, you have to take deposits. Um, again, we do that for our rentable facilities now, but, the, but those are buildings, right? Like it'd be hard to, I don't know what kind of parties you're hosting there, but it'd be hard to really do. <laughs> oh, it is. I mean, you know, it is a nice area to have a party and it's yes. very easy to maintain. Yeah, not not a consumable like a net. And I agree that it's prone for abuse if it's not well inventoried. So that would I would be that would be one of those kind of variable costs of a plan like this is now you have what operating overhead do we have to make sure is in place such that we can manage the investment. Other questions? Yeah, please. Um, real part, about the deck hockey. Real Has part. anybody approached the Penguins about possible funding? <laughs> yes, uh, or I should say, we, our, one of our landscape architects uh, is in that world okay. and is aware that sometimes the Penguins specifically, but even like US hockey and other sports, they, they wanna proliferate the sport. So we would love to see something like that. Okay. Yeah. Has somebody reached out yet? Uh, no, just because we don't know that we're building it yet, but we, we hope that we're getting enough support that we can do that outreach. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. But if you have a friendly, let us know. 
I have a few contacts in the hockey world, let's put it that way. Oh, very good. We'd love to talk <laughs> to you about that. Okay. Um, please. Uh, written into the budget for all of this, mm -hmm. um, are we taking into effect, I'm, I'm assuming looking at all this follow-up work once everything's built, that we're going to have to increase our maintenance staff? Because mm. it looks like a lot more landscape, unless we're contracting out landscaping and whatnot. So I was just curious, because obviously that's not just a dollar to add bodies and and pay and you know uh, all that insurance, yeah. all those kind of things. So I'm just curious yeah. if that's included into the budget. It's a great question. So there are some offsets. So again, if we have less grass to cut, we save that money. But that's very different than if you've got all new parks to maintain and maybe new equipment that we need to have eyes on. Landscaping's a lot more weeding and stuff. It's not just that and grass. So That's true. They right? don't want to all go up there after it's built and just see all these weeds popping up between all the gravel and all that kind of stuff. I you agree. have to do, I think, more work on that. So um, I can say I've had conversations with our council colleagues that I think we are, we're appropriately staffed in public works for where we are today, but between the streetscape in the spring, between potentially the parks plan, um, we kind of were conceding the point that yes, we need to beef up our headcount. Um, I think from an equipment perspective, we're largely in an okay place. Um, a good example is um, a vent track, which is more, it can have a brush attachment. So maybe if we did a, a, a field that was turf, you may need to brush the turf periodically to make sure that the little rubber pellets are properly disseminated and you don't get overwear in one area. That would be an example of that might be a $40,000 piece of equipment we don't currently have. So um, I would expect, and our engineer can hold me accountable to this, that if these amenities require something special, including landscaping, um, we need to account for it at the, the staffing level. So, please. What is the estimated timeline for this to actually start happening? Yeah. Um, our new manager is here, and I scared her the other day because she <laughs> asked me, so what are we doing with this? Um, if we go the bond route, that means that the money would become immediately available. So you don't have to do this kind of savings over time mentality, which would extend it. Depending on how many of these parks we do and how we phase it, um, I think it's viable that all of what is proposed here could be done within four to five years, uh, which sounds like a long time, but the municipal government really isn't we would want to be deciding what is the highest priority. Um, and that's not just, I mean, obviously you could be working on real in Hamilton at the same time. So there is some paralleling. We're mindful of CSYA activities. We're mindful of summer when all the rentals happen. We're mindful of community day. So we don't wanna be ripping everything apart in peak season, but you obviously can't do a lot of construction in January either. But um, if phased and with funding in hand, four to five years would cover much, if not all of this. Good question. Please. Um, I have a question about the ball, the baseball field. I don't have kids, so I don't know, but I'm just thinking. Sure. I know you said O'Brien, you know, 10 years down the line, maybe changing into something else. Do the kids still use that as a practice field? And if so, can we... Can we afford to take away two baseball fields and only leave two? I don't. I don't know. I. I don't have kids, so I don't know. I just wonder. Our we do use it. CSYA is uh, over there. So can we afford to get rid of two fields and only have two? So we would talking about real field. Yeah. Real field is mainly used as a t-ball field. And okay, it's still a field to use though. Okay. Um, and we've been utilizing um, municipal field a lot more with that. So, so um, you can having just two fields, we can. you can you can do it with what you have. Yes, I, I will say our organization works really well with working together, where a lot of other organizations do not. Right, you only um, so many months and so many Saturdays. Right? Yeah, so well, we, we've been doing it, um, okay. and you know O'Brien Field is used very sparingly for practices, mm -hmm. um, but we manage between the spring and the fall to. I think maybe practice there a couple times, uh, but everything has really gone through, and that's with adding um, fast pitch softball at 12U and possibly having 15. So we we work really well together. Um, we have a good group. We talk to each other, so things are very manageable with with those two fields, with possibly real changing. 
the upgraded panel that would also expand your use there. You'd be able to bring your older kids to play when it's dark. You have lights. True, true. They can't do that currently. So then that adds more time slots there where you'd be able to just utilize that field where we currently can't. And, so, and Hamilton right now is more set up for pony baseball. Yeah, I do. Like we could do our softball and such over there with the change in, in the dynamics of the bases. And it, it would be a huge difference. And you wouldn't get as many rain out games either with this turf. That is true. Uh, which is a big problem. But it would still be a pony field. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I don't want to cut it short, but we have one other big module to talk through this evening. So any final comments on parks before we? Yes, I do. OK, um, there's one online. Thank you. Uh, OK, my question is in regard to Prospect Park. I sure. live in the area. And I was wondering. Where will the children, are you having a children's area with swings? That's a good question. Yeah, there, there was a question about, can we include some amenities for children up there? And Correct. Yeah, so I think the answer is yes. Um, the rendering we had made some assumptions about how it fit within the other parks. But what I'm hearing is, is that there, there are enough, there's a concentration of families up there that it would make sense for us to have some equipment there that's age appropriate for children. So I think we would wanna work that into our revisions. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, I think we're okay. Next steps, again, I won't go to the slide. The next steps are uh, next round of revisions. Jason's taking good notes back there from the engineering perspective. Um, I didn't say the price tag, by the way. Um, if we did everything that I'm proposing, we're proposing, excuse me. Um, I mean, it's over $12 million. Um, our annual budget in the year is just over 5 million. So, I mean, this is significant. Um, and again, it, it, I, I consider it deferred investment as in we can and should have been mindful of making these investments consistently and over time. Um, we're choosing to, to turn a new leaf. Um, but again, that may not be the full amount. This scope may change materially after tonight's conversation. The committee meets again, but I just want folks to understand the scale of this. This is this is not insignificant amount of money, and we understand that. So, okay, um, we're going to switch over to the next module. So I want to thank everyone for your patience. There, we're right on time, especially our youngest member here. You're doing great. <laughs> All right. Um, so we're transitioning to wayfinding this evening. Um, wayfinding is a signage system that many communities, but also if you go to the Steeler game, wayfinding everywhere, right? You know, go this way to concessions, restrooms, etc. cetera. Um, it's everywhere, but you also notice when it's not there. Castle Shannon has not invested ever in a wayfinding system that helps people who don't live here or even people that live here to better navigate their town. So the goal is to make our community easy to navigate, distinctive to see, and a pleasure to enjoy. Um, you don't have to read all the notes here, but just from a kind of planning perspective, wayfinding provides directional hints, this way to the park, this way to Myrtle School, et cetera. It gives you location identification. Hey, you have arrived, or once you've arrived, here's where the police department is versus the uh, rec room or what have you. Uh, it also is a branding opportunity um, because you know when you've arrived at a place that's well branded and we want to want to feel like we're becoming one of those places because uh, our we deserve it. Um, this is just examples of wayfinding. This is not relative to us, but um, you've either been to malls or sporting events or sporting locations. Uh, the right side one is is mock-ups from uh, the city of Falls Church. So these are, it's, they're well-designed, they're homages to the history of their communities, and they are scientifically derived, right? There's a science to how pedestrians navigate, how people with disabilities navigate, how vehicular traffic navigates, and this is all mindful of that. It's also worth saying Castle Shannon is a heavily transit-oriented town with the T, and so anything that's signage today uh, is largely T signage or Port Authority signage, we are due to be doing better for the assets that we control. So um, 
Council in entering into an arrangement with uh, the consulting firm who does this work, um, we had some kind of loose goals in mind. So first and foremost is clarifying traffic patterns. Now the wayfinding project is community wide, but it's true that if you're in any of the major throughways, um, it can be difficult between where T tracks cross or where one way streets cross or where visibility for a no left hand turn sign is. Uh, it can be difficult to navigate our town that has negative ramifications because, and I believe it or not, I was in coffee, et cetera, the other day, a woman walked in and said, I've driven to the vet's office, you know, once a month for years and never knew this coffee shop was here and not for lack of it being there <laughs> because they didn't know to turn left to go down one way willow and uh, it's difficult. So we, we need to improve upon traffic patterning. It's the chance to introduce cohesive and kind of uh, cleaned up uh, design elements uh, with polish and, but still an homage back to our historical assets. It allows us to highlight our assets. We're gonna put all this investment into parks, into our business district, into our streetscape. Uh, we need to navigate people effectively to them and so that they come back. Uh, maybe you've all been to a place where it was hard to get to. I'm guessing you're not as likely to return to that place if it felt hard to get to. I, I'm sorry to say, I think we're one of those places right now and we have to do better. Enhanced safety, um, this is not, while signage is kind of, you perceive it maybe for vehicular traffic, it is equally important for pedestrian traffic. Uh, our town needs to be walkable. We've made investments in sidewalks where able, and we wanna continue that, but safety is primary uh, as far as what wayfinding can do. And then maintaining our charm. Uh, a well-navigated town is one that people want to recurringly visit and if you go on a walking trip with your family, or if you're just trying to see what's new in town, that type of just like, let's just go down and enjoy ourselves. It would be nice to have that here. Um, so a number of these investments coming together will allow us to do that. Now we're going to look at, slide this over. Um, so council has hired a design firm. The design firm had created three renderings. Um, Two of them were not in keeping with the style or the kind of history of the, the borough. And so council had coalesced behind one particular design. Um, it is not a final thing. We're bringing it here because we want to hear feedback. Um, we all have Facebook, by the way. So we understand that there's a discussion to be had about, are we doing enough? Is this recognizing our history? So let's have that conversation. Same rules as the parks plan. Let me just get through the design mock. So you see all the different interpretations of it. Uh, and then let's have a conversation. Um, so there's been uh, some speculation about the Celtic knot. Um, so things that were really important for us to keep. We have Irish and Scottish lineage, tends to lean a little bit more Irish. Um, there's a history to the name, there's a history to some existing images. Uh, but one thing that's indisputed is that we have an Irish uh, foundation to us We've been leveraging colors that were green and gold. We are keeping those. Of course we are. That's, that's a wonderful part of what we're doing. Um, in this case, Celtic Knot is a new image um, for signage, not for everything, but for signage. Uh, it has some interesting meanings. Um, friendship, love, community, togetherness, luck, health, prosperity. These are all things that, again, people can coalesce behind those themes. Like this is what we want for our community. And it also tethers back to our, our history as a group. Um, so I'm gonna show you some different versions of this and how it is positioned within the borough. Um, so this is what would be gateway signage, just a, a design mock. Um, so this would be at either end of 88, uh, where you enter the big ones. At the smaller entrances, so maybe where Whitehall and Grove Road comes in, you'd see a sign more scaled down like this. We have existing signs in those locations. You know those that are gold and, and green as well. Um, what you're seeing, this texture behind it, um, it, it's an imprint of that logo, the, the icon that you see there. But it's actually an etching. And I'm going to turn my camera. I'll show it here. This isn't that same design, but this is an example of a water jet etching of aluminum. It's see-through. And it's a neat design, people are welcome to, to see this, but it's a neat design element, especially in a well-trafficked area with major artery. Um, it actually helps because you can see behind it. You can see through it. Um, so from a visibility perspective, 88 is so well-trafficked, 
and is a multi-lane uh, corridor that having signage that actually has vistaed the viewpoints through, it's not only an, an interesting design element, but it's actually a practical thing. Um, so if people want, I'll pass it around. Uh, just see, see again, that's not the exact design. It's more just a, an example of that see-through. That texture would continue throughout the different types of, they call them sign types. Um, so the sign type on the left would be more of a directional signage. So you arrived at the municipal center or one of our parks. You want to know where the splash pad is versus the rental down at the bottom. We would direct them. Uh, the etching is uh, designed or pr imprinted on the back of the sign is just an added little design feature. This is a mock of what uh, a location-based sign would be. You've arrived at real park or any existing, thank you so much, um, any existing park. So we keep the explicit reference to Castle Shannon and then really show what park you've arrived at, provide any additional information. Directional way, uh, signage for parking itself. Uh, and then something I think is really neat is instead of just our generic traffic-y looking road signs is that we do, bring that etching touch into every street sign in the borough. If you've ever been to another municipality like a Upper St. Clair, uh, where they actually have the name of the, the community on there, the, that's expensive, of course, but even just this little design touch, it's artful, it's subtle, but it's unifying. Everything looks like it belongs together. Um, and it's still that classic green that we're used to, right? So it's not a departure from, from the style that we were accustomed to seeing. So this is the entirety of the sign family. So just to reiterate, um, it's not final form yet. There will be tweaks. Um, I will say that this is this style, um, maybe apart from the icon itself, uh, was definitely the best of the bunch that the consultants brought to us. And um, we would like to be able to implement something like this. But um, with that, uh, I wanna open up the floor and have people ask questions or comments. <clears throat> Yeah, please. I do have a question. Mm -hmm. I'm not in favor at all of changing to a castle font. I think we are Castle Shannon. I think the castle is how people know us. I think a castle would look beautiful in the middle of borough of Castle Shannon, put a castle in there. But in doing all this, we will you will know more where, where you're at, but is it going to bring anything to us? Is it going to bring like any businesses to us? You know, it, it sounds like this is. You're thinking this is going to happen and everyone's going to come to Castle Shannon. Well, that's a good question. A um, couple ways to answer that. Um, uh, and I, th I think you've lived here for a while, right? I've lived here my entire life, 60 years. How, how long in that 60 years have the castle been a feature? 60 years. I believe that, right? So uh, it's not to say that there hasn't been progress in Castle Shannon over 60 years. But I think we can all agree that we've also seen some neighborhoods kind of grow up faster than we have. Businesses choosing to locate their businesses elsewhere or in neighboring communities and skipping over us. Um, I know I have business, uh, I have meetings with prospective business owners often where they say, well, I'm thinking about going here. The rents are higher, but I know I have the foot traffic. I know I have the parking. I know I have a streetscape that's walkable. I know I have other business owners. I know I have a chamber of commerce. We don't have those things here in over 60 years. Unfortunately, I'm worried that part of it is because we haven't professionalized that image. Um, now, I'm just one opinion, but I think I look at it as people say, keep the castle because it's always been here 60 years. I believe that. But if I said, do we think that that image, that brand, that identity is going to suddenly change all of a sudden and welcome new businesses? I think it's more likely that a pivot in a different direction is more likely to welcome than keeping to the same 60 year strategy. Well, I think if you're updating the signage like you are, that's great. But I, again, like I said, I, I, I'm very well known. I'm more in favor of keeping a cat, the castle. Sure. I think if you're updating the signage to look like this, keeping the castle isn't going to be a detriment to okay. that. It's going to still welcome you to Castle Shannon. And I get Castle Shannon is hard to navigate. You've got Willow, Upper Willow, Lower Willow. You know, you're trying to tell someone where they're going, and it is tough. I 100% agree with that. But obviously, since I've lived here my entire life, I can walk it backwards. Sure, I agree. Because yeah. I walk the borough most of the time. Yeah. 
but you know to make it more walkable friendly there's a lot of things that need to be done and i think that's where you need to ask the people that are walking it i walk this because i live on willow i do walk and a lot of times i'm pushing a stroller with my grandkids sometimes i'm just walking it on my own but in many respects it is a tough walkable community because these where there are sidewalks they become very narrow i get we need telephone poles but some of it is because people that have let things overgrow into the sidewalk area you can't get past yeah i agree so i mean i'm just saying there needs to be a lot more done than signage and i i agree with the signage okay there. i i perfectly agree with the signage up okay there. and, and like i just want to i want to make sure i'm understanding your point while well, you like the investment in wayfinding rather you just want to keep that that design element exactly. that is yeah okay that's good i just wanted to make sure i understood the point go ahead in the back uh, the additional uh cost for the science with the additional little um design that you have is there a cost comparison of just having a sign in our community to help um find the way without having the additional little um what, what's the cost of it? yeah and so for those online the question was and about again, cost and also, can, can we do the uh -huh. same signage without adding a different logo can we can we do both can we add the way the, the wayfinding and, and have kind of it's would benefit both we have a community that um, has been here for 60 years that wants to keep the logo and then we want to encourage uh, new businesses to come here i don't think that a logo would be a detriment to a business to you know move to to our uh, lo locations wayfinding might be encourage them mm -hmm. i don't think a logo whether it be a celtic logo or a, a castle would determine whether a business would move there yeah maybe not directly albeit i think it does communicate externally what we value as a community mm -hmm. so if you've if you've seen a community that hasn't changed in 60 years or 100 years i think that tells you do they embrace technology are they trying to freshen up their community do they value change are they open to it I mean, these are kind of the, if I'm a business owner, uh, I ask those questions, not because of a logo, but just generally what's the look, feel, and, and tenor of a community. So, so your impression of this is, is changing a logo is going to change the, the overall outcome of the outside of your community? Uh, I think it would make a sea change in perception. I do, I personally do believe that. Um, but to your other question about cost, so um, the cost of, of, if we kept a castle on there, there's no difference in cost. I mean, that this is, that is not a material change in the scheme of what it would take to construct these. Um, I'm talking about the additional little diagram and, and the, the little design that you passed around. Oh, the etching or, yeah. Yes. So could we um, elect to do a simplified version of wayfinding? Yes, you could. I will say that the material choices that are reflected here actually are among the more cost-effective that can happen. So signs get expensive when they're lit from within, these are not. Signs get expensive when they're not, um, they're, they're cut with different materials and you have to actually assemble them. These are largely aluminum sheets that are, are laser cut or etched. But could you just provide the, the, the difference of cost between the, the fancy stuff with the see-through and then just the normal sign that we, that we have for it? I actually can't just because, yeah, this isn't final yet, so they, they didn't give us a spec cost on these. And we also didn't entertain a more simplified version that's dialed back as far as aesthetics. Yep. So, Brian? I'm going to tell you, I love it. Um, I, I'm, I'm a true believer that sometimes it's okay to change. Um, it's not that I, I, I get that we're in 60 years of having the castle. I'm going to go as a parent and having my kids with the CSYA, not as a board member or anything, but as a person. If you had that Celtic and you were able to put that on the sleeve of one of their jerseys, that looks cool. A castle, I, I don't, I don't see that. Um, I wouldn't put it on shirt. So some of those little intricacies, I, I think this really looks like something that I would, I mean, I would, I would have that on a shirt that I'd want to wear. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm gonna be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I've seen the old shirts and such with the castle, and it's nothing against the castle. I mean, I know it's the heritage, and it's, but I, I wouldn't be purchasing things with that. Um, so if you're actually looking at possible merchandising of, of items as well, I see this as a definite upgrade and, and in a different direction. And it's not changing Castle Shannon in any way. It's still Castle Shannon. You just don't have to have a castle for everything. So I, I think that looks, I mean, 
If I'm driving around, I, I'd be proud of that uh, personally. Okay. Thanks for the feedback. Yep, Janelle. So when it, it comes to marketing, let me add this one about the marketing aspect. Um, you know, we want to have, you know, everyone's kind of inclusive. We want everyone to be the same and the signage to be the same. So the businesses, the fire department, the police department, all of those that actually utilize the council currently, mm -hmm. um, is it going to be on their dime to change it? Uh, the, or is it going to be on the borough's dime? So, well, it actually... If, yeah, I'm saying if it ends up being changed mm -hmm. to that, I mean, is the, is I want, the borough changing? I'm going to skip ahead. For it or? I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit just because I prepped some historical stuff. So um, the castle's been used in a number of formats, even beyond what the borough does. So you're seeing a couple different uh, images of police badges. Um, you actually see some for profit uses of former coal mine here. Uh, the CSRC has done some uh, stylized renderings in the past that that are still a castle, but they deviate from the convention. Um, so as I, I wrote something on the borough website to hopefully dispel some of the myths that um, using a new icon within the context of wayfinding does not obligate the borough to change its seal, which is that upper right one. It does not obligate the fire department because they're an independent organization. Uh, we don't run them. They're a volunteer organization. Uh, that's actually theirs on the bottom left. So they can and should celebrate that as long as they wish. Um, so, uh, and I, our police chief is here. I've not asked him to make any changes to their badges. Uh, the cars are, are displayed as they are. Um, this is very much a, a wayfinding initiative that is, is narrowed to that. But um, so it's just important to note though that and I have other history slides we can go through, but it, the, there, even within what look like similar concepts of castle, there's actually some variations too. So it, the notion that we're staying historically accurate all the time, even just in this one slide, you can see that we've been deviating from what was considered the original for quite some time. No, we haven't. Well, been, you know, kind of just changing it slightly. I mean, it all still is castle. Mm -hmm. When I look up there, all like, I do just these castles, but mm -hmm. I mean, that didn't really. So you're saying that regardless of what the signage says, they can still keep their castle and they can still be identified with the castle. Correct? Of course. And all of their signage can be with that. Of okay. course. And then the second thing is with wayfinding, wayfinding is obviously you know, you find your way and to really lay out the thing. So the infrastructure of the area has to be kind of put together. Now, you said that woman that was going to the vet. Mm -hmm. If, say, Ice Castle wants to have Ice Castle this way or Coffee et cetera this way, are you going to offer that as a borough or are you going to have the businesses pay to have that done? Good question. Um, so some communities, if there is a marquee uh, attraction, they will include that in their official wayfinding. Um, I can say, and our consultants share the same concern, a little bit of a slippery slope because people feel like, well, I'm marquee and my business is just as important as so-and-so's. So um, the guidance that we've given the consultants is that we're not interested in, in any for-profit company representation on the signage. One way to mitigate that though, is there's no reason why you can't publish and post maps. Maps are all inclusive. Maps can be updated year over year. So if you think of your kiosks, not unlike, you know, you go to Kennywood and you see a map of the place, um, you could do a community map and just budget for that being updated every so often. Then you could do something for the, for the businesses. If you've been to Carnegie, Carnegie does uh, a really good job at mapping their main streets with handouts. So you go into a store, I mean, they will gladly say, go visit our neighbors, like go to the paper store, go to the coffee shop, go to West Flying Squirrel, it's not there anymore. Um, but uh, that's the type of environment we want to have here, but it won't be at, at anyone's cost that they have to do that. So I know, like in Minneapolis, family in Minneapolis, and they're really into this way of life. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of great little towns such as ours, like outside of Minneapolis. And there are like to coffee, et cetera, to everyday athletic, to you know, the funeral home, the ice castle. Now, is that something that individually those businesses could get approval to have their own 
signage added to the wayfinder, or are we just not even going to do that at all? Yeah. Because part of wayfinding is helping draw customers to the areas, to the businesses. So if we're just going to draw them to our parks. That's fantastic. But what about drawing in people to our businesses to get that downtown bustling like we're looking to do? Mm -hmm. I mean, with the with the whole new plan of doing all of the sidewalks and doing the downtown area. I mean, don't we want to, you know, brighten the hey, this is the coffee shop, this is a great salon, this is, you know, like are we gonna allow them to do so? Um, so they already are allowed to do a number of things so they can get a permit for a sandwich board. They of course can do signage on their facade. Um, so I would say it's, it's probably government's job to allow them to do that in direct traffic more so to, we can show you where to park. We can show you any destinations that are proximate. Other ways you can do it is you can brand a district. So if you wanted to brand the Willow shops or Willow East and Willow West, then you make a place and they call it placemaking. Yeah, that would be great. I know Mount Lebanon Shops has that sign, so maybe we could do like a little shop or something like that. Yes, so we're open to, they would call that kind of district marketing and we're open to that. There is a, um, you know, we're a complicated town insofar as is Route 88 its own district. It's not terribly walkable, right? Like if you want to walk from Burger King to Arby's, you'd take your life in your hands to do it. So then you still have some of those equitable issues. And, but it, that's one that I'm happy to navigate versus property owner to property owner. Why aren't you taking people to the funeral home the same way you're taking them to the stained glass store? That it gets costly and cumbersome to do that. So there's actually, I wanna make sure the online ones, I'll come back to you. Uh, I think Eileen, I heard you, I don't know. Okay, yeah, your hands up. Eileen, would you like to go? I have several questions. Um, Will this change, will the castle logo change on the letterhead of the borough? Uh, it, that's the borough seal. So no, this is not a, we're not moving to change the seal, no. Okay. And so you said about paying homage to our history. Yes, we were started by the Irish and the Germans, but you know, you talk about moving forward. Um, a Celtic knot does represent that. But what about all of the other ethnicity and nationalities in Castle Shannon? Now you're leaving them all out by going to the Irish side. And I don't think that's being inclusive of everyone in Castle Shannon. Where the castle is neutral, they're all over the world, and it includes everyone. Well, and, it's uh, an go ahead. It's an interesting point. I, I didn't think of it that way. I will say that uh, this is a particular castle, or at least a rendering of a particular castle, and it is in Ireland. Um, now, again, does the average person know the full history? Probably not, but I guess I would say that, you know, the, the attachment that people have to the, specifically the Irish roots, namely Shannon as, as an Irish surname or Shanahan from its original, uh, I think that's very well known as Irish. And I don't think that anyone would begrudge an homage to what is overwhelmingly Irish. Yeah, but that's what was started here. And now you want to make changes, but you're making changes to include one group and excluding a lot of other groups by picking a symbol that is of a certain nationality. And don't get me wrong, I'm Irish. I love the Celtic knot. I just don't think it includes or represents all of the nationalities and, and, and ethnicities in our borough at this time. You're probably right. I guess my, my, not that I'm trying to counterpoint, but I don't think that the castle does either. Um, but, because... but if you're changing, then you need to change neutrally. You can't change. I mean, there's no reason to change it. I'm totally against this. I think it represents the history of the borough and I really hope it doesn't get changed. But if you're gonna change it, then you can't use that counterpoint because you're changing it to something Irish too. If you were going something neutral, that would be a different story. Yeah, I, I take your point. And the other, the other question is, do you really think that when you're talking to business managers, I get updating the wayfinding, but do you really think a castle 
on the new signage is really gonna deter someone from moving to Castle Shannon rather than a Celtic knot. I mean, upgrading, yes, the wayfinding system, it would be fabulous. It would make Castle Shannon look fabulous, but I really don't think a Celtic knot and a castle are gonna make a difference on the signage. Yeah, I think um, my biggest thing is we, we're framing this as castle versus not, but the more accurate way to frame it is something that's been here since the, since the first rendering and that hasn't changed in at least 60 years. So the question is, are we a community that embraces change, evolves, which we know culturally we have, we know there's ebb and flow of age, of demographics, of races, of ethnicities, um, so it, I guess it's more of, it's not, is the castle right or wrong? It's, is change okay or not? And I think all, all we're saying is that we're open to the idea of change, especially when it still has firm uh, association with our history. Right, but by changing the signs and taking the castle away, you're taking our history away. No castles being taken away. Okay, last question. Do you know when you will make a, be making a decision on this? Um, so the, the timing of this was supposed to be that we wanted at least the, the streetscape oriented signage to be installed at the same time as the streetscape was built. We are now aware that because of supply chain and labor shortages that the streetscape won't start until the spring. So we've actually earned, earned the worst way, time that we can stew on this. But again, the, the reason why we're here is council wants to hear what people have to say and the decision hasn't been made. So um, I would say council wants to probably revisit this in its formal sessions, not immediately, but soon after. Um, I think too, there's been an interest in alternative renderings of the castle so that we can still say we kept the castle, but is there a way to make it such that it doesn't look as visually cluttered uh, as the existing one does? So there's a world where that is also considered yeah question okay i'd ask that you and council reconsider this and uh keep the castle since it is our history and and those that raised us here and um you know five people in council were not born and raised here and may not understand the history of all of us that lived here all our lives so i just ask that you revisit it please all right thank you thank you eileen we have a question can, can I see the nod again? Of course, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I just had some other stuff if it's useful. Um, I'll give you a okay. close up if that's you, there you yeah, go. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Okay, so moving into the future and keeping the past, why can't we just merge it and somehow put a castle in the middle of that and turn it over so it's a diamond instead of a square? <laughs> <laughs> because that would show it's a diamond in the rough. The I... circle will be unity with every everybody in cultural and we're moving forward but keeping the past. Why are you taking the um, castle park down? No, no, I think, oh, that's Dorma. That's wrong. So that's are, that's Dorma. Honey. So what are you? <laughs> yes, but that's a Dorma. That's a different bird. That's a great <laughs> question. <though>. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, again, the, the wayfinding can proceed and the logo change. I think we, we, this is true of council on any other area of expertise that is not native to us, that we, we hire experts and say, you know, these people, do, the, the group we've, found, we've used has done this in hundreds of communities, some local, some not. Um, so I think all we said to them was, if you can use the castle, we're open to it. But what we found is that it's actually very hard to use the existing castle logo in a modern way. And there's a lot of design nuance to that. Um, if you put a castle at that same level, you couldn't see it. And you may see it when you drive past, uh, you see a police car drive past. We all know subconsciously it's a castle. Very few people otherwise would recognize it as such. Um, it doesn't render well digitally. So you'll see that even on our website, we want to use it, but in the website banner, it's too small to see. Um, it's, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll just go back to that style. Um, so it, this is what you would call hyper-realistic design. I mean, you literally see the contour lines like it's water flowing or like it's the hillside. Um, 
that's not what modern design or anything that looks kind of fresh and clean would leverage. I'm not saying it's not historic. I'm just simply saying, if you were taking the time and investing the resources to modernize, you wouldn't choose something like that. Um, and you could look in the private sector too, and they would they would say the same. So to your point, as far as like, can you merge the two? I believe there's probably a design where you could. Um, this conversation though that we're having is one where I, I think there's some folks that say, don't change a thing. There's some folks that say, let's modernize and see what it does. Um, a hybrid, what almost some people might say is like a really bad amalgamation, right? <laughs> it's like trying to please everyone, but no one's happy. I, I would worry that that would be an outcome. Um, but then again, I, I think we're never, we are not going to please everyone with this decision. I think we just know that, so. Lisa? So the Celtic um, design came from the engineer? Um, so our designers, we basically said, we're looking for icons that are an homage back to our Irish roots. Um, but we said, we are giving you creative freedom. You know, tell us what you think and use your expertise. So they did try to do castle renderings and they just said, it's very hard for us to do, take something that's hyper-realistic and keep the form and oh, still make it. See it with the castle was to see. And just a this idea. Yeah. And just one more question. I don't want to keep going on. I hope you're busy. Um, oh, I'm here. The, the funding on this, is that part of the straight states grant? Um, so we already in this year's budget, we funded the design work for it. So the, the what you're seeing here. Um, we do not have the cost to fabricate the signs. So if it were approved, meaning council agrees to do the wayfinding initiative. It would have to identify the funds to create to build the signs and install them. So it's an additional fund, additional cost for the borough. Mm -hmm. So it's not part of the grant for the street state. It will be something additional for us. That's correct. Okay. Yes. And that's not budgeted for the year or next year yet. Um, well, once I know, again, we we want to know that people want to do wayfinding. If we see it as a good investment, we'll get the price. Um, I think that it is equally as important as much of what we're doing with the rest of the bond issuance. So I would want it to come out of the proceeds of the bond. Um, so more loans, we're looking at like 12 million. How many million loans are we going to be doing for parks and for wayfinding? Well, again, the, the important part of that is that the, the debt service, meaning the annual payment we make on the debt is the same that we pay right now. Um, so while it, the amount looks big, you term it such that it isn't invasive or overwhelming to any of the taxpayers and government enjoys the benefits of that just because we have a tax base to back it. So we get, we get affordable terms on long-term debt. Understandable, but the taxpayers don't want to understand that tax ramifications that will happen in the future. In the system. Yeah. Like I said, that there would be no slated increase because it's within our existing debt service. If you, obviously I can't tell you what council will do in a decade, but um, there, there would no, not require tax increase to do this. Yep. I just think the lady that was commenting on the internet, like the, the castle is not going away. It's the official seal. It's just not going to be on the side. That's, that's basically the way it is. Nobody is taking away the actual castle itself. They're just doing an upgrade for the signage, which I, I don't think honestly driving through Castle Shannon, that would bother me in any way. Um, she said about it being, you know, I, I'm not Irish. That doesn't bother me. That, like, I'm still going to live in Castle Shannon. That's not going to stop me from coming here. Um, a Celtic knot is not going to bother me. I think, to be honest, I think there's some people making a bigger deal of the signage, thinking the castle is totally going away. It is not being eliminated, and, and that's what you can see. It's still going to be there. But as I said, it's a branding. I would rather see a Celtic not than see a castle like it is. I mean, as I said, on shirts I've seen it, it it's, it's not very flattering. Um, it's not something that I want to wear. The kids are probably going to wear something with that Celtic knot. You even put that with it, you know, that, that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. So I, I, it's not the castle's not going away. And I, I think that's the big misconception here. Yeah, well, uh, and we're missing. thank you. And I'll just reiterate. So again, we, we proudly, and again, the fire department, some of them was on the left, police in the middle. You've seen it on our public works fleet um, and castles elsewhere. That's the um, CSRC's, one of their working logos that embraces the castle. The, the borough has no interest in replacing or asking. This is purely on the wayfinding side, just being able to introduce that, that visual. Gentleman over here. 
I appreciate you putting this together, but just want to thank you. In regards to the branding, I, I like the image. Mm -hmm. um, Mark, we can't hear. Would you mind or speak up? Sure. Thanks, Eileen. Sure. I appreciate you putting this on. I, I like the image. I think that your an earlier point that you made pertaining to other communities have have seen greater business development, greater foot traffic. From my perspective, a new brand helps the community stand out. It, it creates it creates a little bit of new, fresh. Take another look at, at Castle Shannon. Uh, evaluate the, the community as a whole. And, and the second point that stands out to me. The, the loyalty piece. There's a lot of loyalty related to the castle, and I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, the folks that have been in the community their entire life have been long term residents. I've been here 16 years. I, I think ultimately, when you look at sustainability and bringing in new foot traffic, new business development, a, a, new, a new logo, a new look creates then those folks that are going to have that loyalty over the next so many decades. The next generations. I, I think your plan is visionary in the fact that it looks forward, but doesn't eliminate or or discourage the heritage that people have come accustomed with and really take pride. In. So that's my comment. Thank you for sharing. We appreciate it. Oh, good. Don't know. I think our community is very welcoming, especially in the library. We have, you know, many different. In case folks didn't hear, Donnell had shared that she sees a lot of ethnicities and nationalities in the library, and she does not believe that a Celtic knot would uh, discourage or make anyone feel less welcome. Did I see another? Yes. Sorry, go ahead. So being Irish myself, that's, that's the Dara knot. Um, it's a good question. It actually, it's kind of an amalgamation of a few. And the reason why is, be, sorry, I'm between here. Um, there are probably six, seven or eight types of Celtic knots. Um, we didn't want to take any of the overt, some of them are overtly of a particular faith. That's um, what I'm saying is we absolutely make sure, I mean, if this does get approved, I mean, Sure. We make sure it has no connection because there is separation between church and state. We yeah. definitely don't want to work Thank you. community or Christian community. Like yes. we are a diverse community. We want to be able to, like Donnell said, we want to be able to cater to everyone. So I will that looks like one that was on my grandmother's cross. So I just yeah. So I, I and she was a devout Christian. Yeah. So we just we need to make sure that we're very cognizant about what we are if we end up doing this what we are using that's right yeah so in the, in, it's a great point because if you do a 45 degree turn on that logo it's cruciform um and that is common in celtic culture that it is an overt reference to christianity so um so no we're we're mindful that we don't want any subtext there um there's also and again i we had to go in the weeds on this there are yeah, hate-based imagery that not even this logo, but others could be interpreted as, and you just got to be super careful. Well, so if, if you do turn it, like if Brian is saying, if you don't put it on the shirt, but if they, they accidentally turn it a little bit, and then it represents something else, like we yep. definitely need to look into that. For mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, we agree. Yep. Mark, just the mayor. This all started back in the 1900s. There was as many, if not more, Germans here than who are Irish. Yeah. I, I wouldn't get too excited if whoever's Irish here. <laughs> so, you know, I don't, I think we ought to have the German flag on there. But, yeah. yeah. Just, just so I thought people should know that. Yeah. And, and I want to just share with folks some of the history we did find, because I, I just think folks are, what I'm hearing is that people are interested in the history. So we did, we did learn some things through this exercise. Um, folks have read the history. Uh, David Strawbridge commemorated his land grant here, called it Castle Shanahan. That was not a reference to a physical castle. It was because it was kind of a grandiose way of saying, this is my chateau, this is my estate, this is my whatever. So castle was more of a, a way of communicating wealth or status or, or aesthetics. Um, what we found is we actually found the castle. <laughs> um, 
So what you're looking at, and this is an artistic rendering on the left, I, I think the fire departments actually is the most clear from an architectural perspective. Um, this is uh, a place called the Rock of Cashel, or otherwise known as St. Patrick's Rock. Um, now I'm not an architectural historian, but why did we go through this trouble? So let's assume that whoever made this rendering, which I'm not sure that, I don't know who that person was, let's call it 50, 60, 70 years ago, made a rendering. That pointed top, uh, that's called a round tower. Think of it as a bell tower. So it usually was more of a, in a cathedral setting that you'd see a bell tower. There's about 120 of those in Ireland. So you take 33,000 castles, you winnow it down to the ones that have the round tower, and then you winnow it down further to ones that have a round tower that's not freestanding, but it's actually embedded within a, the site of another physical property. And, and you've got one of a few, and this is the one that actually has some physical characteristics. Um, if, you, if you look, and again, it's not perfect. This is truly an artistic interpretation. You have obviously the spire, you have the flat top here, which is mimicked here. You have some buildings down here that run kind of away from the building. You have the wall that's constructed in the front. What's ironic though, is that that is not a castle. It's a cathedral and you actually see it better. There's some drone footage here. Um, it's not on a river. It's actually in the middle of uh, Tipperary, which is in the middle kind of central to Southern Ireland. Uh, this is a 3D rendering. Um, so you have the, the round tower on the bottom. Then you have truly a cruciform or crucifix shaped cathedral. And then the building in the left side, this is a chapel. So what's really interesting is we borrowed from something that actually isn't a physical castle. Now, again, that's not to take away that the castle is an icon we've been using, uh, but with folks being very interested in history, I just thought we should know what we have. We should know what, we're, what our renderings are based off of. Um, and we feel pretty good that this is the actual site that we're, we're orienting on. So for what it's worth, I mean, there's oral history and there's history and somewhere in between is the truth. Um, I've heard again, just in my time in the borough that, um, you know, that David Strawbridge was talking about the river Shannon when he named it Castle Shanahan. Maybe that's right. Maybe our logo should be a river then. Uh, if it's truly about a castle, the question is, does this castle mean anything? Is it truly relevant to David Strawbridge or any of our founders? In one case, it doesn't matter because it's the one we've been using, but I actually have my doubts that it's related to David Strawbridge or any homage that he made to his where he grew up in Northern Ireland either. Um, but again, the, this is just for everyone's edification. We did a little research project and we actually think we found the appropriate castle. Um, oh, castle. <laughs> so um, take that home with you as a fun fact, but um, we, did do, we did do the research on it. Now we are um, close to time. Um, my, oh, please, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Sorry, um, I have two different points. One's a question and one's a statement. Sure. I love history. Oh, great. I don't like change. However, okay. I do like the emblem on the sign. And here's what I took from it, not the Celtic part. Okay. I like the slide where at the bottom you showed what it meant. My suggestion is you emphasize that and not the Celtic being Irish. What those words are, what you said, that's what I took from it. That's the kind of community that we want to be. All of those adjectives that you showed being the definition of the Celtic. That's great. I idea. think that's what you what you focus on more than anything. And you kind of mentioned that you did say, but I think that's what you do. You emphasize. Look at these adjectives. This is what we want to be. Yeah. I think whole, whole yeah. different thought. Because when you were talking about the signage and the young, the young lady asked about businesses. Mm -hmm. um, I just wondered, uh, is it possible, and, and maybe you thought about this, and maybe you haven't even thought this far, that if, if, if I'm coffee, et cetera, and I want to match the signage, can you have it where the borough can say to the businesses, if you'd like to get a sign at your cost mm -hmm. to match, we could do it, because obviously it would be cheaper if you can do everybody together, and they're paying for their own sign, as opposed to them having to go out and create a sign on their own that matches, you know, normally the more you buy, the better cost it is. 
So is that an option maybe for businesses? So, hey, we'd love to match. We're willing to pay, but let's work together so that everyone does look the same. If, if the business community was keen on that, uh, we would be listening. I agree. And thank you too for that. Yeah, and, and those, that's what you have to have. I appreciate there. that. That's a really good point. Thank you. All right. Any further comments on wayfinding? Okay. Uh, you stayed late into the evening, so thank you. Um, again, next steps here are not as immediate, but we are going to look at costing, see if other design considerations are appropriate to consider, and council would ultimately be making the, the move to do that. I would hope maybe by top of next year in time for uh, the streetscape so that they can be installed concurrently with that project being done. So um, very good. Well, you've been great. Thank you. Um, let us know if we can help. I'll linger. My colleagues will linger. Enjoy your evenings. And thank you to those who joined online. Oh, I forgot. Sorry. I got this. I got this.